Greetings. Once again, AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Reckon here from Avon High School, and I'm joined by my awesome seventh period class. Let's give it up. Seventh period class. You can tell they are excited. They are so excited about optimization. They can't control it. We're already two examples in. We're taking a look at our third example, which is, as you can read, all about finding the least amount of paper given a certain print size. And this is certainly something that publishing companies are typically going to deal with from time to time. They want to optimize the amount of paper given the fact that their print size has to be so big. So without further ado, let's take a look at our example three. So I'm going to move my camera down here to the bottom, let you kind of read all that cool stuff up in the top. It says a rectangular page is to contain 24 square inches of print. The margins at the top and the bottom of the page are to be one and a half inches and the margins on the left and right are to be one inch. What should the dimensions of the page be so that the least amount of paper is used? So that's what we're dealing with in our particular problem. And we're very fortunate that we have a picture drawn for us. Wow, we'll take that, right? We'll take a picture any day of the week. Now, is this the way that we would all maybe set up this picture? Will we all label it the same way? Very likely no, and that doesn't really make much difference how you decide to label. But I want you to take a look very specifically. What's going on here is I've got some print, right? I'll kind of highlight that. Whoops, that's not very good, is it? I'll highlight that so that we can distinguish the print part from the paper part here. And so we have these four corners like this. And so that's going to be our print. And the way that this particular problem has been set up is the width, I guess, the distance across here to here is defined as Y, right? So you might have to kind of look up above and see where the Y was on the outside of the page. And same along the vertical part of the print, that looks to be X. Now, Okay, that's a little weird. I don't know if I would necessarily have done that. I don't think my, my class would have done that. Well, you would probably switch the X and the Y maybe, but it's okay. It doesn't matter where you put those values as long as they're in there, okay? And you're going to find out here in a moment there's a totally other approach that you could have taken to setting up. So we've got this margin around the page, right? One on the sides, one and a half on the top and the bottom. we got to figure out how small can we make that page so that we can still fit 24 square inches of print? So if you've watched some of the other videos, you may have noticed that we, we, we begin with this thing called the primary equation, PE, and that is always going to be the equation that you're going to find the maximum or minimum of. We have to remember which one are we finding in this problem? Well, we've got the word least amount of paper kind of implies a certain geometric property of paper. Paper is a two-dimensional shape, and that shape is that of a rectangle, and the amount of paper would be the area of that rectangle. Now, here's the tricky part. My class is looking at this too. What would be the dimensions of our paper? Would it be x times y? And it wouldn't, would it, right? Because we've got these margins that are built in. And so if we take the x distance, you see that we still have to add some stuff to it, right? Some margin distance both above and below. And that would equate to three extra inches of space, right? And so we're going to have a distance of x plus 3 vertically. And then across the side, I think it's pretty clear that we've got y plus 2. Right, I'm going to squeeze this parenthesis in a little bit. Okay, well, that's certainly one approach to this problem. We'll talk about the other approach again here in a second. But if you recall, if you've watched some of the other videos, we've always made the statement here about are we ready to take the derivative? The fact that we have, whoops, sorry. The fact that we have, the fact that we have both x and y here is a bad thing, right? We don't feel like we're comfortable yet taking that derivative. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go over to a secondary equation. 
and we're going to use some kind of relationship that's already in the problem. Typically, it's a number that's given in the stem of the problem, like that 24. And we're going to figure out some equation that involves the x and y, that also involves the 24. The fact that 24 is the amount of print simply means that all of this stuff is 24. Am I right? The amount of print itself. And that, again, is a rectangle that has dimensions x times y, and so we have another area formula of a rectangle. And so there we have it. We have a good primary equation and secondary equation that will work. Now, before we move on, I wanted to ask, could a student have begun this problem by letting the entire page have a length of y and a width of x? That's probably one of the ways I would have thought about it. And so your primary equation here would be x times y. Would that work? Yeah, yeah, as long as the secondary equation would have subtractions of 3 and 2 for the x and the y. So it's like either we're going to have an ugly primary or an ugly secondary equation, however you decide to set it up. We're going to go ahead and stick with what we've got right here, if that's okay. And we'll move right into our primary equation transformation which means the secondary equation has to be solved for a variable. Pick one, doesn't matter. We'll use y. Sometimes we like to keep things in terms of x. And so over here on the left, this primary equation now is going to take on a whole new look. Instead, it's going to be x plus 3 times the quantity 24 over x plus 2. So it got a little uglier there, didn't it? Yeah. But we can still handle it, right? We have to take a derivative. We can take this derivative using, I don't know, anybody like really eager to take the derivative using the product rule? No. Any of you want to take the derivative using the product rule? It's okay to say yes. We're kind of all in the camp where we're going to say no because we can avoid it with just some simple algebra, right? If we just Foil this out. It won't be so bad. We're going to set ourselves up for a really easy derivative. x times 24 over x. Check that out. That cleans up really nicely, doesn't it? Just 24. The outside is going to be 2 times x. Okay, the only bad part is going to be this inside part, but we can handle it. 3 times 24 over x is 72 over x. And then, of course, 3 times 2 is 6. But by and large, this is going to be pretty easy to take the derivative of. Even this 72 over x, if it's bothering you, we can think of him as dreaming of being written as 72x to the negative 1, so his derivative won't be so bad. So it's a prime time. A prime, prime time. I like that. Prime time. That's when you take a derivative. Prime time. So 24 and 6 doesn't really serve any purpose to add them together. Derivative is going to be 0. Derivative of 2x is 2. And then over here to the 72x to the negative 1 business, we got negative 144x to the negative 2. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Negative 72x to the negative 2. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm thinking like second derivative here. So 72 times negative 1 is negative 72. Now we're going to have to find critical numbers which is typically setting the derivative equal to zero. And I sort of have a rule here in our class. We all sort of agree that if we could write this with a single fraction, we tend to do a better job with the algebra. Negative exponents don't play real nicely either, so we'll fix that. And so if we just take this guy just for the time being and write it so that it has a common denominator of x squared, I think we're going to have 2x squared minus 72 over x squared. I say we've got it, right? We've got a really easy derivative here that we can set equal to 0, right? Whenever a fraction is equal to 0, it's because the top is equal to 0. So we're fixing that. And then as we slowly but surely work our way to solving this, we could factor out a 2. And it's pretty likely a calculus student in most every class across the country, teachers that I know, 
won't require them to do any algebra work here. If you know the answer, you can jump right to it. The AP exam is not going to make you list a bunch of algebra steps as well. But when all is said and done, you're going to get 6 and negative 6 for your x. But you guys see a number that we can cross out? Yeah, we don't, we don't need this negative 6, do we? We can't have a newspaper print that has a, a, a width of, of negative 6. And along those same lines, a prime undefined, well, that would be where the denominator is going to be equivalent to 0, and I think we can get rid of him, right? I mean, that's going to produce x equals 0. Um, I don't know about you, but that, that, that wouldn't... It wouldn't take too much time to read, would it? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like your AP US history assignments to have like that much print in them? You'd be done before you started, right? So we're not going to have zero as a, as a viable critical number, which means the only critical number we have is six, which means it's got to be our right answer because it seems like this problem is logical that it has an optimal amount of, of paper. But if you're not sure, remember, there is this optional step that you can use just to verify that this is indeed a minimum. You either use the first derivative test, or you can use the second derivative test. Doesn't matter which one you use. Typically, the decision can be based on which, uh, whether or not the second derivative is easy to take. So if you look over here at this first derivative, how fast can you guys take the second derivative? Pretty crazy fast, right? You can take the derivative faster than you can probably write it down. And so I might opt for the second derivative test here, where a double prime is going to be 0 plus 144 x to the negative 3, which could be written as x cubed in the bottom, and now you see that if you went through the process of plugging in that first derivative critical value of 6, there's no question that it's positive. And when you have a second derivative that's positive, what do we say? You guys can say this with me, really, on the count of three. What is that? One, two, three. Yay, a min, right? Yeah, we're happy. We got a minimum. That's what we wanted in this problem, least amount of paper. Now, the only thing that you could screw up here would be to not answer the question. So I'm going to kind of move myself over here so that we can write the answer down there. And the question said, what should the dimensions of the page be? So you don't have to write a phrase, but you certainly can. You know, you could say the page should be. I can kind of stop with that, and that would be fine. But I got this answer of 6, right? Is that going to be one of my dimensions? Is x a length of the page? No, it's the print. I still have to tack on this extra inch and a half on the top and the bottom in order for that to be that vertical length of the page. So that 6 plus that extra 3 is going to be 9, and my units would be inches, of course. And then I have to do the same thing for the y, once I find him. Now, we haven't found the y yet, but it doesn't take too long to track down a really good equation here that's going to help you find that. And isn't the y going to be 4, you guys? Everybody agree with that? 24 over 6. Um, that y would have been a little bit hard to find if we didn't organize it, so that's part of what you know I try to, treat, to, to teach when I'm having my students solve these optimization problems. So that 4 is going to have to add a 1 and a 1, which is going to take him up to 6 inches. And that, as it turns out, is going to be the optimal size of the paper that contains the 24 square inches of print. Anyway, I hope this helps. we got a couple more videos, I think three more total, that will round out our optimization. The next one is about basically stabilizing two posts with a stake in the middle. Be sure to check out example four. In the meantime, keep studying your calculus. We'll see you.